Great. Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. He is part of our podcast community. He has his own podcast on our show and is author Mark Do Doherty. He, he is... <laughs> I almost got, got it. it. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he is just an amazing author. He came out with a great book that he's going to tell you a little about, and he's going to go over some of the techniques and tools in the book. And he's just amazing. Um, and some of the topics today, I'm really excited to talk about because they're things that affect us in our daily lives. And he has some great tools, techniques, and strategies to help you cope with a lot of these issues that all of us at some point in our lives have. So Mark, I'm gonna let you take it away. Tell everybody a little about yourself and, and what's going on and, and about today's episode, cause I'm really excited. <laughs> well, to start off, my name is Mark Doherty. <laughs> I got my own last name, right? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'll, be, I'll be 68 uh, this September, so I'm starting to get up there. Uh, yes, indeed, I, I wrote two books. One's called Reset. Uh, it's kind of my journey. I, I suffered from fear and anxiety uh, most of my adulthood, and then it culminated into uh, cancer at, when I was 48 years old. And then at 54, what little colon I had left burst, and I really then went into a spiral with that. And so uh, kind of, and we'll, we'll probably talk about it Um as I got better, I lost my anxiety and kind of it was at 60 years old. So about seven or eight years ago, I felt like I got my life back, which I, to be honest with you, I never thought I would get. And so I was very fortunate. And, and that was one of the reasons I wrote the, the book. Um, and, and then actually, uh, I, on the other end, back in 2020, I, uh, I did really well in the stock market. And so I wrote a book called I'm a Genius, Just Ask Me. And, uh, <laughs> and it was about how I made a ton of money in 2020 and then promptly lost about half of it over the last two or three years. And so it's kind of my journey as a, as a young adult going into the Air Force and learning about um, finance. I have a fi finance degree or a, an accounting degree from Bradley University. I, I went there after I was in the Air Force for four years. So I have a financial background. That was kind of my uh, that was kind of my uh, work history. And so anyways, I, 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 I did both books and uh, found you. And uh, here we are. So <laughs> let, let's get at it. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I really, you know, I really commend you because you went through a lot and um, it is very, very hard when we have fear and anxiety and it takes control of us. And many people suffer from that. And, and it's something that people don't like to talk about. People just tend to seclude themselves and they, they bubbleize themselves from the world. And many people are, are, are afraid to open up and ask others for help. I feel like also just from knowing people like yourself, they don't want to be judged. And, and because the world is so labelized and stigmatized and because you you have these emotions, I feel like sometimes it, it dampers our self-esteem. So then, you know, you feel less worthy of yourself and to have to open up and, and be vulnerable to another human being. I think is is extremely hard just for someone that that even, you know, for anybody to just open up and, and to be able to express, you know, the feelings and emotions that especially have taken control of our lives is, is very hard. And, you know, for someone who suffered from fear and anxiety and, and your whole world was, you know, put on hold in freeze mode, you know, how were you able to actually, you know, first overcome that fear and anxiety because to this day when when people talk about fear and anxiety even when people are on the on the podcast and they mention about fear and anxiety people swarm in because so many people have fear and anxiety but they go around and they're quiet about it and they're looking for solutions but they just don't know what that solution is what was that solution for you how did you get out of it you know, I think, well, it took a long time, first of all, and it wasn't easy. And I think you hit the nail on the head early on here. Um, there's a lot of embarrassment that goes along with uh, anxiety. And, and, and it, 
mine started with fear for my father and, and, and made its way up to anxiety. And mm-hmm. as a young man, especially, and I kind of view it as a, as a male thing for me, anyways, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I felt really emasculated that I had these feelings and I can't, I couldn't make them go away and I couldn't stop them, to be honest with you. And um, one of the things you brought up uh, just a bit ago was about what I, what I call risk. Um, you have to you have to take a risk, and God, I I want to say maybe hope people will understand. I think in today's day and age, I think it's easier to confront these feelings or these anxieties because they're a lot more well-known than yeah. they were when I, I had my first anxiety attack when I, in 1975 okay. and nobody, you know, there wasn't the stigma of social anxiety or agor- agoraphobia where people couldn't leave their homes. And I think, and I, I never, I was actually kind of surprised. I never took any, uh, the doctors never prescribed anything until I actually saw a psychiatrist. And I think at the time, back in the 70s, Valium was kind of the big anti-anxiety yeah. thing. And and I had, I've never had it. And, and so <clears throat> I had to, I had to figure out a way to kind of pound through it. And, and I, I didn't do well. Um, one of the things I did was exercise, as I as I said in the in the first podcast. The other yeah. thing I did too, and you know, I'm not I, I'm not ashamed to say that I did it. And fortunately, I didn't turn in, in, into an alcoholic. But I used I used to some degree alcohol to kind of calm my nerves. You know, like when I was in college, if I went to a party, you know, I kind of I didn't get like you know drunk to where I was you know, falling down and stuff, uh, mostly because I couldn't even handle that much alcohol. But it was kind of, it was kind of my MO, if I got into a a situation where I was uncomfortable, to have a beer or two, or I was kind of a whiskey and water guy, uh, to where I would try to feel relaxed. And so those were initially how I I tried to um, uh, get through that stuff. And then um, as I uh, progressed in college, my dad ran away from home and it's, uh, it's in the book. It's a long story, but it kind of threw me for a loop. You know, I was always kind of waiting for my father to kind of show up and pat me on the back. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he didn't, and I didn't, I guess, really expect him to uh, when I, when I passed my Russian uh, exam in, I was a Russian linguist in the air force. I passed my Russian exam and that was a big deal for me. And, yeah. you know, my folks, my folks didn't come to any of that. And then uh, I was kind of hoping he was going to come to my college graduation and he had run away from home uh, a year prior and left my mom and my little sister all by herself, all by themselves. And so my my dad, my dad was kind of never there to show up. And I was starting to really I want to say collapse, if you will. And I was in my senior year of college, so I knew I had to get my shit together. So uh, as I explained in the book, uh, you know, this was before the internet and uh, iPhones. So I literally walked down to the corner. They had, you know, a a phone booth there. And I I looked in the yellow pages and don't know how I chose this therapist, but uh, went in there and, uh, and started doing biofeedback, which was, again, I think it was just, I didn't have a lot of money. You know, he asked me how much I could pay him. I said, you know, I was working, I was a college student. I told him I could probably afford 25 bucks a session. And so um, there wasn't a lot of mental back and forth discussion, talking. It's mostly biofeedback and just trying to teach me how to relax. And right. uh, after graduation, I, I moved out to Portland, Oregon, which is where I live now in Oregon. Uh, and um met my wife and got married. And when my mother came out for my um, wedding, I kind of had what I call Vietnam flashbacks. I, you know, probably uh, PTSD to some degree. And I really, I felt bad because my mom had flown out for my wedding. My dad had run away from home and I didn't really even want my mom to be around. I felt embarrassed because I felt sick. I, you know, it's stunning that I even made it through my wedding day. <laughs> it was a, it was, it was a long day. It was a long day. 
So at that point, you know, I was really, I was really spiraling down. I had a good job. I was an accountant. Uh, somehow I was able to kind of, I, I want to say, fake my way through life a bit, but I realized I was really, I was at a point where I really needed to get some help. And so uh, at that point, I went into therapy and really started working with a therapist to try and work this stuff out. And, and did you find therapy to be very beneficial? Because I think therapy is is great. I think some people are afraid to go for therapy. They're afraid to talk to somebody. But how did you feel what going to therapy? Um, you know, initially I was nervous about it because, again, there was kind of this was back in the 80s still. And, uh, you know, there was some stigma around therapy, you know uh you know people think you're a nut job and stuff like that really what i think you know uh stacy and i don't know if you've ever been in therapy but i think one of the problems with having anxiety or depression or or any any kind of emotional mental issue like that is that fear of talking and and what i think therapy does accomplish is it gets you to talk and I'm yes. a real, I'm a real believer in that. You know, it's kind of funny sometimes, uh, you know, when I watch these stupid, well, I won't call them stupid, um, Instagram reels, you know, and I'm one of these guys sometimes, you know, I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. And, and, you know, some of these really power ones are like, you know, don't ever share your feelings. Don't let anybody know your game plan, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, <laughs> and I couldn't agree, disagree more with those guys. I yeah. think... I think the problem with that people have is they're afraid to expose themselves. I'll tell yeah. you a great, I, I saw this, I saw this thing on Instagram. It was a blip and I wound up watching the episode. It's, it's a series on Netflix called modern love. And I think it was the third episode, uh, Anne Hathaway, the actress mm -hmm. played the part of a bipolar woman. And when she was manic and up, she was a superstar. And she was well-liked at work. Her, her work was outstanding. But when she hit her low, she couldn't get out of bed. And so she was missing work. She wound up for uh, whatever reason. She either got, I, I don't know if it was clear or not, she either quit or got terminated. And as she was leaving, and this was a great this was a great episode and it really hit me. I actually started crying at this moment and I'll tell you about it. So anyway, she's getting ready to leave and her coworker says, um, Hey, I'd like to get a coffee with you. And, and Anne Hathaway goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like give me a call. And she goes, no, I want to have it right now. And so they go and they have coffee and, Anne, you could see it. And, and as a guy who suffered from anxiety, she realized she had to put her cards on the table. And so she told this woman, this coworker, and she started crying and she said, I'm bipolar. And she goes, that's my problem. And she goes, I want to be your friend, but there's times when I can't be a great friend. And it yeah. really hit me that she took, the point of it, I think was, she took that risk and she yeah. opened up, she opened up herself and shared who she was. And the beauty of it was, and this is the part that people missed, I think, Stacy, the beauty of it was this woman accepted her. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest fear. Anybody with fear and anxiety and depression and whether you're bipolar or whatever, is this yeah. fear of exposure that you're not going to be loved, you know? And, yeah. and, it, and, and so she, she's in this coffee shop and she starts crying and they kind of bond and then the episode kind of ends and it's only an hour episode. And I would encourage your, uh, your listeners to watch it. It's really awesome. Uh, it shows her walking down the street and she's, she looks great. She, she went and saw a psychiatrist. She got medication, which I'm, I'm very pro med and we can talk about that if you want. But she, mm -hmm. she was getting her life back. She was learning how to manage her life as it was. And yeah. that really that really hit home with me because I felt for a long time I was embarrassed and um, I wanted to hide it. 
And therapy for me really helped me, I think, get over it because it, it forces you to talk, you know. Right. And and that I found very helpful for me. I have to agree with you, you know, and, and when you talk about it, you know, uh, Anne Hathaway and how she had to open up, you know, kind of reminded me of, of me when, you know, with my epilepsy, when my seizures were active, you know, I had to tell the people who I, I was friends with that, hey, I have epilepsy, I might have a seizure, you know, and if I do, you know, it's not a big deal, just do this, this and this, you know, but you, it, the, it was not easy to always say that, you know, it was it was much easier to have that handful of close friends. And I try to keep it quiet as, as best as I could because people are judgmental or people are scared of what they don't know. And people do fear what they don't know. And uh, so I, I, I get that. And with when it comes to opening up your emotions and talking about it, I think it's great because it starts to get those repressed emotions out too. It, it's like when you start talking, you might not even realize that there are certain things in your life that really trigger you. And you don't even know it until you start talking and then a word or a phrase comes out of your mouth. And then all of a sudden the tears start coming and you can feel the emotions, you know, you can feel the tingling throughout your body. And, and, you know, that's when you realize, Hey, these things really have an impact in my life. And, you know, and by talking about it, I think you get it out of your system and then you learn how to cope with it. And then you could move on rather than, Put yourself in that freeze mode and get stuck in life like so many people do. I know when, uh, and you know, it's kind of funny. I interviewed for a job one time and I, I was locked in on this job. And at the end, uh, the owner wanted me to talk to this. Uh, he belonged to kind of a CEO club. And yeah. the head of this club wanted to interview me. And I started like an idiot. I started talking about my father. And I wound up not getting the job. And he, you know, it was kind of funny because I, I made, I was like, I, I'm sure I was the top two candidates. And they they never called me back and said whether they were going to hire me or not. And I actually had found this job through a CPA friend of mine who was right. one of the client, clients at their firm. And he said, I go, hey, Mike, how come I didn't get a call back or, or I thought I was locked in on this job? And he said, the guy felt that you had... Um, authority issues and i go he's right because and, and i noticed when because my dad was a real authoritarian and he was a yeller and a hitter and i noticed when i had job i had some tough bosses i worked for small companies you know a lot of the companies i started with were like million dollar revenue companies i mean they were barely hanging on and, you know, people get pissed, you know, when their backs are up against the wall. And I had many shout outs with my bosses. It's like, hey, I'm an intelligent person. You can talk to me. If you got to yell at me, then we're going to have a problem. And I was, you know, even though I was fearful of that, I would get to that point, Stacy, where I'm not going to take this shit anymore. Right. And I, I always had that. It's kind of funny because I locked horns with almost every boss that I had. And I'm shocked I never got fired, which I think is a testimony to um, I, I knew what I was doing. I was good at what I did and I wasn't going to take shit. But right. Again, it wasn't easy. And I always <laughs> knew every time every time I crossed that line, typically within two months, I would quit and go look for another job. Because I, you know, I understood once once you lock horns with the boss, you're toast. You know, it's yeah. it, either either you're going to leave first or, or you're going to get fired, you know. <laughs> so I, I I had this thing, too, about being like yelled at. And you were talking about triggers. That was a trigger for me. It's like you can talk to me like an intelligent person. Doesn't mean you can't get mad. But don't start screaming and calling me an idiot and stuff. Like, how could you be so stupid and do right. it's like. It's like, you can't talk to me like that. And I, I try not to talk to people like that either because I'm very cognizant of how I felt doing it. You know, the other thing too, Stacy, that I think it's important and I, and I can't stress this enough, uh, and I don't know if people understand that this, is that there's a difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Yes, and, there and is. The, it, and the difference is a psychiatrist is an, a, a doctor, an MD, and they can 
prescribed medication. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really bothered me, I, when I first went into therapy, I was in my late twenties and it wasn't until I switched from a psychologist to a, a psychiatrist that I was able to get on meds. And while they were, they were pretty primitive at the time. I was taking something called nortriptyline, which mm -hmm. I, I don't think they probably even describe, uh, uh, prescribe anymore because there's so many other, you know, there's Lexapro and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and even though it wasn't like the holy grail, it it kind of, it was like a cold plunge. It kind of snapped me out of it a little bit to where yeah. I noticed in, instead of having, 20 panic attacks a day. Maybe that I would only have five to 10, which was right. still better than 20. And yeah. so I, I would encourage, you know, I think it's one thing if you got an issue that is not affecting you physically, let's say, in your right. life, but, but you need to talk it out. I think a, yeah. uh, like a social worker or a uh, psychologist, it's perfect. They're, right. They tend to be cheaper uh, you know, they're, they're PhDs, they're not idiots, but they can't prescribe medicine. For me, right. I had, I had physical symptoms where I would start coughing or I felt nauseated or I wasn't a big sweater, but I, I, I get like, you know, cotton mouth or like, you know, I just felt like my head was going to blow up. Right. For those kind of people, you know, you need a medication, you need something to help you break that cycle. And I yes. think it's really important that people understand that. And don't, mm -hmm. you know, I I was really disappointed as I became more sophisticated. I was really disappointed in my psych psychologist that they didn't recommend that I try to get on medication. I thought that was a drop on their part. Yeah. And again, and again, you know, I I don't want to fault them, but you know, you're kind of a money train for them. You know, there's always this question of when are you ready to leave? And I was always, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be honest. I was always the guy who said, okay, I think I'm in a good spot now. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go away for a while and try and manage my life. If yes. I have issues, I'm going to come back. You know, they never quite, at least I never had the experience of, I think you're cured or we're good for right now. You know, yeah. you, again, I'm, I'm kind of this believer of you got to take your control of your own body, your own health, take responsibility for who you are and do that kind of stuff. So, right. No, I definitely believe in integrated medication. I think, you know, um, you could try to do things holistically. You could try to, you know, you can try to incorporate ways to calm yourself and to get through certain situations. <clears throat> and for some people that might not have, you know, might have a very mild case and for different reasons, because everybody's different and everybody thinks differently and handles things differently, it might work for some. But then for others, you know, it may not work. And you don't want to get to that point where you're so anxious or you're having panic attacks for no reason all of a sudden you're walking in the middle of the street and all of a sudden a panic attack comes you know and that's a, that's a terrible terrible feeling to have to ex, you know experience some people you know they could be driving and all of a sudden they get a panic attack and they have to pull to the side of the road and they don't know why they're getting the panic attack and their heart's racing and they feel like they're going to get a heart attack you know, so, you know, when you have these situations, you know, you can't always rely on holistic, you know, to, to, you have to go to a doctor, you have to, you know, really get evaluated. And why is this happening to me? What's the root cause? And what kind of solutions are we looking at to cure this problem? So it doesn't happen anymore. You know, I think you're exactly right. You know, through my life, I've, I've read tons of meditation books and stuff like that. And it, you're absolutely right. When you're in the middle, it's one thing to like meditate and try and relax, but you can't do that. You know, five minutes before, like I worked at Nike, there's, you can't, you know, five minutes before you're, you're ready to stand up and give a speech. You can't sit there and close your eyes and, and, you know, meditate your fear away. It, it yeah. just isn't going to happen. You know, one of the things that I use to manage my anxiety, as I said earlier, was exercise. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm a real believer when you have this feeling, if you can, you need to try and break it as quickly as possible. Now, yes. like one of one of the things I do every morning now, we live on, I'm, the last podcast we had, I was in Mexico and I, yeah. I got back to the United States here last week. 
and we live on a small lake here in Oregon. And the water is probably because the lake starts at the end where we live. And so every day I jump in and do kind of a cold immersion. And, <laughs> and it's it's great. And I you can't even think about it. You just have to jump in. And yeah. it's probably between 60 and 65 degrees. I mean, it's chilly, but yeah. it it it's a great feeling. It's like for those two minutes you're in that lake you're you're super mindful and, and yeah. there's a lot to be said about being mindful as well and again i think that's part of what makes exercise so effective is that you're sweating but you're yeah. actually you're actually mindful and if you're doing it at a pretty good clip you're 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 breathing heavy you might be a little bit of pain you know you might get a stitch in your side or you're lifting weights and your muscles hurt it it takes you what you got to try and do is get out of your head and, right. and 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 it's it's hard to do but but once the anxiety subsides um uh it's much easier to get into those things like meditation and some of those other things so i i don't discount them you know i did i did acupuncture uh yeah. i i believe in it you know sometimes it's like you know it's funny i i did uh acupuncture when i was going through chemotherapy and you never know whether it's working or not, but I know I never got to the point of being so nauseated that I threw up. And so it's kind of this cause and effect. It's like, okay, I didn't throw up and I was doing acupuncture, so it must be working, you know? Right. Now, now whether it was working or not, who knows? But you you, you take the ball and you run with it. So, yeah. So some, and, and, and we all do that. It's like, sometimes, you know, it's like I'm running and I feel better. I'm just going to keep doing it, you know? And, and, and assume, and, and you can see, you know, you look, you feel thinner, you look better, you know, so you know it works, but uh, sometimes you just got to stick with it. But yeah, sometimes holistic stuff is, is great if your, if your anxieties and fears or issues are, let's see, relatively minor on the big, on the Richter scale of, of stress, you know, when you right. got a lot, when you got a lot of stuff you're going through, not so much, it's hard to even sit still, let alone try and meditate. So. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. You, you talk about loneliness, and one of the biggest psychological impacts you had were was be, fe, the feeling of loneliness and and despair. And I feel like any anybody that goes through you know anxiety and fear, you know they they try to seclude themselves and they try to you know they don't want to mm. be around people. You know, think about it. If you're fearful. And, and, and you have anxiety, why would you want to be around a lot of people? You're just going to, your, your anxiety level is going to go up. And, and if you're fearful about being around people, the more people, the more fearful, the more anxiety you're going to have. But then when you look at loneliness and, you know, I know people that, you know, have fear and anxiety and, and they do keep themselves secluded in their own little circle. And I always say to myself, that has to be so depressing, you know, to consistently keep yourself, you know, you're by yourself, you know, and you're, you're, you know, every day it's just you, you know, you might have a significant other, you know, you might see people that stop by, but overall, most of the time you're by yourself. And I know for, for a fact, when I was going through my epilepsy and my seizures were in control, I had to give up driving for 15 years. And even though I was in my home and I was working from my home, I felt imprisoned in my home. And if that made sense, and I felt very lonely and it was a terrible feeling. So I, you know, I, I want, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there that have that because if you're, you have fear and you have anxiety, then you are experiencing lon loneliness because you're not out there trying to be the center of attention and, and, and in the middle of the crowd. And for you, how did it feel when you were going through those lonely feelings? Because I know for me, it was just, it, it was one of the, the it was such a grueling time, those 15 years of my life. I just felt so alone, even though I had people around me that loved me. I felt just by myself many times imprisoned. You know, I, I would say when I was going through my anxiety attacks uh, and panic attacks, I didn't feel a lot of aloneness then because I was still like my first panic attack. I was in the air force. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, I didn't go AWOL. So I was, I was at work at, you know, I was at work every day. I, I was on flight status. I had to fly. So I was around people all the time, even though I felt, let's say somewhat maybe uncomfortable. They were guys I knew. Uh, I didn't, I don't know that I ever really shared with them what I was going through, but I was able to kind of fake my way through. And then after that college, and then I went to work where I really felt loneliness was when I got sick. Mm. And I think I, the last time I talked to you, uh, you know, I had read Katie Couric's husband died of, of colon cancer and I had rectal cancer. And he, there was a little line in her book that she said, her husband made this comment that having cancer was the loneliest thing he ever went through. And I put in my book, and this is how bad, how lonely I was. I remember uh, sitting on the toilet, my behind was, is actually stone shut. And at the time, uh, my urethra got nicked and I was leaking urine out of my behind. And so there was, there was technically nothing was supposed to be coming out. And I'm, I'm sitting on the toilet. I'm dry heaving in a bucket. Uh, there's stuff coming out, which wasn't supposed to be coming out. And I could hear my wife because I was sleeping upstairs because I didn't even have much strength to even be able to walk up and down the stairs. I mean, I could, but it was more yeah. convenient to sleep upstairs. And I could hear my wife asleep. I want to say snoring. <laughs> and I'm sitting there. And honest to God, I thought to myself, does anybody give a shit whether I'm dead or alive? And it was really an aha moment. And like yeah. you said, you were you were around people that loved you. And yet you felt all alone because like you with your epilepsy, you know, I had this cancer and there was nobody else around me that did. So there was nobody to talk to and, and nobody, you know, people, it, it's like, you know, I find it humorous sometimes that doctors, male doctors think they know what a woman's going through having a baby. You know, and it's like when I had rectal cancer and I, I called the first time I went to the bathroom after I because my colon got uh, um, uh, disconnected and then reconnected. And the first time I went to the bathroom, it burned like hell. And I called mm -hmm. the doctor and he acted like he knew what I was going through. And he's like, take Metamucil and just slow it down. That didn't do anything. And I realized it's easy for people to say or think that they know how you feel. They have no, they have no idea. And so, and, and, you know, it was funny. We were up at the cabin here one time, probably 10 years ago, and my wife and my daughter, and I was really angry after I got better when I was, my colon burst at 54 and around 55 or 56, as I started to come out of it, I, I really got angry because uh, I felt like I lost so much of my life. And we were here talking one time to my wife and my daughter, and I broke down crying. I said, you guys will never understand how lonely I felt. I felt, you know, even though my wife was taking care of me, yeah. there was not there was not that emotional, like I, like I told my wife, and I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here or whatever, but you know, I never remember my wife ever like just crawling in bed when I was in the hospital or, or grab my hand and say, you know, honey, I'm so sorry you're going through this. You know, okay. she was so busy, concerned about taking the physical physical care of me. She totally spaced the emotional part. And I right. think most people and I think honestly, Stacy, maybe you felt that way, too. Most people miss that part. They see they they hear cancer or they see you maybe in a epileptic seizure that's all physical they have no yeah. idea what's what's going on in your head and, and and that was something that really struck you know it's one thing to be alone it's another thing to be lonely and while right. they both sound the same they're totally separate you could be alone and be thrilled to be alone yeah but when and when you're lonely and you got nobody that you think loves you or cares about you Man, that's a hard that's a hard problem to solve, you know. Yeah. Well, that's why I wrote my book, Epilepsy, You're Not Alone, is because if I could hit one person in and help them emotionally, you know, then my goal was met. Because, you know, um, I think people 
doctors, you know, I've had this discussion with doctors when I was on advisory boards, you know, they understand from a medical perspective, but they don't know what the actual patient is going through. They don't know the mental state of, of where it brings a person, the fear based, you know, the, you know, what, what's next? How long do I have? Will I, will I, you know, if I fall on the floor, will I hit my head? If I hit my head, will I get dementia? You know, will I get Alzheimer's from this? You know, you know, will it come back? You know, these are all questions, you know, with, with those two types of, of conditions, you know, like, and everything starts going through people's heads, when, you know, because then you start to appreciate life and you see life from a different perspective. And then you realize, you know, what, you know, how easily things can be taken away from you. And yeah. if it is taken away, you know, that's, that's very, that's fearful in itself. You know, and, and that's a very good point, Stacy. And I'll give you a great example. It was after all of my surgeries, I was still a mess. And I would call my, I'd call my gastroenterologist, and he's like, "Mark, I can't help you." It's like, you know, my my stool when I went to the bathroom, it smelled like um, acid. I mean, my system. You know, if you could imagine I had chemotherapy and I didn't have solid food for six months, you know, all your bio, your bacteria and stuff in your stomach, that yeah. was all that was all gone. And I would yeah. call my doctors and it's like, help me. And he's like, Mark, basically, he's he's saying without coming out and saying it, he's like, Mark, I'm a surgeon, a surgeon. I can't do anything for you anymore. And so yeah. I wound up going to see a natural path. And got on this powdered nourishment that like totally helped fix my system. But that right. was almost just a fluke. It, again, is one of the things I talk about in my book is you got to take your, you got to take responsibility for your own health. If you're going to yeah. sit around and wait for the doctor to come knock on your door and tell you, I can help you. Well, I, I'm sad to break you the news to you, but it ain't going to happen. Exactly. And so. You know, if if you feel like something's wrong with you, you got to keep pushing. And yeah. so, you know, it's it's kind of a shame because there, at least when I had it, and it might be different now, but there was not this holistic view of cancer when I had this twenty years ago. I think yeah. now, I think now, Stacy and I could be wrong. I've heard of these things where if you get cancer, you're kind of assigned a nurse or an advocate. Let's call them. And then yeah. they talk, they funnel you to the doctor, or to the nurse or this guy or that guy. I yeah. didn't have any of that. And right. so um, I had nobody to advocate for me. I mean, I had, I had what I considered great surgeons, although they screwed up too. You know, as I put in my book, I, I lost one of my kidneys, my, uh, my ureter got nicked. I mean, I had all kinds of problems with stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and people ask me, you know, did you ever think of suing your doctor? And it's like, no, I thought they always had my best intention, you know, no pun intended, but shit happens sometimes. And, you know, I think surgery is as much an art as, as it is the science. And yeah. some sometimes bad things happen. You know, it always kind of cracks me up. And I, you know, I get it, you know, but people want nose jobs and breast implants and butt lifts and stuff. And I get that, but what I think people, and you see it on shows like botched, I don't yeah. think people under, I don't think people understand when you go under the knife, I think there's a better than 50, 50 chance something bad's going to happen. You know, you're going to get a bacteria or your, your, your procedure doesn't work out the way you wanted it to, or, you know, the doctor was having a bad day. I mean, there's yeah. all kinds of, all kinds of stuff that can happen. So you better you know, you better think twice about going under the knife and, uh, and, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta be responsible for your own health. Yeah. I, I don't think people realize that the first time you are opened up, your whole body chemistry changes when you're exposed to oxygen, your, and your, your insides of your body starts changing immediately because our body was not meant for the oxygen to enter it in that respect, you know, into the bloodstream, like mm -hmm. when you cut someone open. So, you know, and, and anything could happen, you know, there are so many things that even when, when they talk about cosmetic surgery, you know, people have had surgery done and have had terrible problems, even oh. They've had deviated septums. You know, people have gone in for these surgeries, and some. I can't tell you how many people have come out and said, 
I breed the worst I've ever had. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I was promising them that they were going to breed the best they ever, you know, would. And so you don't know what is going to happen when you go underneath the knife. It's a 50 50. It's a coin toss. Right, it really right. is. And you have to have a certain amount of trust. You know, I, I'm not a religious guy. And people would say to me, uh, you know, you got to believe in God or you're in God's hands. And I, was, and I always used to say, you know, I believe in my doctors. I, you know, I had a trust that they had my best interest at heart. Right. And, and, and like I always told uh, people, don't ever tell your doctor you're going to sue him until after surgery, not before. <laughs> you send the food back at a restaurant, right? <laughs> yeah, eat the whole thing, then send it back. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, you know, lonely, you know, and I think loneliness gets back to, to, you know, I think at the end of the day, and I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked I'm even saying this, but you know what, it, it all kind of gets down to love. And I, I suppose being loved and feeling loved, you know, and when you, when you're that lonely, uh, you feel like in the world, nobody cares or nobody loves you. And that's, that's a tough thing to get over, you know, and, uh. I no no man is an island, as they say, Stacy. You know, we all we all think we're tough guys, but at the end of the day, you know, you need people, you need people to love you, and, and you need to care for people as well. I mean, it's a it's a two way street. I think the biggest mistake I see in a lot of people when when um, people would talk to me is that they would have a condition, um, and like you med mentioned just earlier, just moments earlier. All they wanted was a hug or, or, you know, someone just saying, it's going to be okay. I'm here for you. You know, instead they got advice on what, what they should do and shouldn't do. And, and, you know, and what would be the best choice and, you know, yes. and that's not what a lot of people are looking for. They, they, they already know what they should and shouldn't do. They, they know what they want to do. They're not look, if they're looking for advice, they're going to ask for it. If they're not asking for it and, but, and, but they're looking, they're looking at you for something, you know, immediately you, you should pick up that they're, they're not looking for that advice. They're just looking for someone to show care and to just, just show a little empathy and, you know, and that goes a long way and that, you know, and yeah. that's what people want, you know, and I, I think it's so important that people understand that. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you too, like I am a big believer in, in positivity. The, you know, the key to survival is positivity. With all this happening, how did you stay positive? How did you not get to the point where like, is it really worth it? I know so many people that go through so much and, and I got a lot, of, a lot of the people that stay positive lived long and lived, you know, fulfilling lives with all the tragedy that went on medically with them. And then the ones that as soon as they, they, the, they let positivity go from their lives is when their lives ended and, you know, mindset, the key to, to key to life is positivity. You know, how did you stay positive and how strong do you think being positive is when it comes to surviving cancer or any other illness? Well, I, th I think it's huge and I think it's documented, you know, scientifically that, uh, you know, attitude is is everything. Um, you know, it, it's that's actually a great question, because for me, it was almost a blessing. And I put in the book after 20 years plus of these anxiety attacks, panic attacks, where you couldn't touch anything. There was nothing yeah. fit physical other than I was bleeding when I went to the bathroom and I felt nauseated. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I see the doctor, he does a colonoscopy. I got cancer and it, I was almost grateful because now I had something physical that I could work on. Yeah. And that in itself was kind of a positive thing for me. It allowed me to switch Stacy from the, mental side of being sick and now yeah. the physical side because once you get cancer man you get a gastroenterologist and you get a radiation oncologist and you get a reg regular oncologist and it's go 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 and you don't have time to think you know they got you moving 
and and now everything's physical you're getting radiation you're getting scoped <laughs> you have surgery it's it's all physical now and it it winds up taking your head out of the game which is is what you want to do but right. to kind of answer your question i i think i was grateful that i had anxiety versus depression and wow. there was moments i remember i had surgery and i came home and my temperature went up to 103 and 104 wow. and i remember it was like midnight and my wife sally wanted to take me to the hospital and i was like I, i'm like i don't want to go and i remember <laughs> i was laying in bed and i put my head in the pillow and I, and I actually said this to myself. I said, if there is a God, take me now. It's like I was done with this shit. You know, yeah. I had so many. And then if you read my book, I mean, I, there were so many bad things that happened to me. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great question, Stacey. And I'm not sure I have a great answer other than uh, I, I try to brag that I have this great Irish wit about me. I always made jokes. I, I'm I'm kind of a joker as it is. It's part of my deep personality. I think it helped pull me out, mm -hmm. but um, it it was tough. And I could see where people, boy, there's times when you get you know how the question is, and I don't have the answer, Stacy. Is how many times you get knocked down before you say I'm done? For mm -hmm. some people, it's once. For some people, it's a hundred. For some people, it's never. And and I, I will say, you know, I think about this a lot, too. At 68, if I got like bladder cancer, for instance, like I had a lot of radiation down in my pelvic area because that's yeah. where my tumor was. And right. one of the things that they find out now is that years later, you wind up potentially getting cancer of the bladder because you had so much radiation down there. Wow. And there was even talk that I was going to have to, I, when I had a hole in my, when I had a hole in my urethra, they were talking about putting in a urine bag on top of my stoma bag oh, for, like, wow. for like six months. Cause they were going to go in and try and repair this thing. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. you got, you know, you got to be kidding me. You know, I right. just, I, you know, I, I didn't, so I, I just, I, 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 I just tried to stay positive tried to do the best I could. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I learned as a young person, especially as I went into the Air Force, was kind of to never give up. You know, right. I'm almost, I almost now um, have this thing like almost tell me I can't do something so that I'll do it. You know, it's almost like breaking the rules kind of a thing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm just wired like that. And, and I know a lot of people aren't. And, and I, and so I wonder sometimes if it came back, if I ever got hit with cancer again, would I be yeah. as up as upbeat? Because you know, it's it's one thing I think to have cancer at 48, you know, yeah. still relatively young, you know, but now it's 68, I've been around the block a few times, you know. Um so I hate to say this, but sex isn't as important as it used to be. You didn't <laughs> don't quote. Don't put that on tape, though. Block <laughs> so, 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 you know, there's some things it's like, you know, I, it, and one of the things I would never do, Stacy, is suck my family dry trying to stay alive. I think that is bullshit, you know, so I could live two more months. Who gives a crap, you know? Right. I, I, I'm really pragmatic that way. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to suck people down with me I, I tell people if i find out and i'm in mexico i'm I'm gonna smoke a big doobie and just suck for it out and hope an orca <laughs> whale just comes and eats me <laughs> <laughs> and maybe we could end on that note <laughs> yeah, i like that note i like that note. <laughs> that's how you, that's how you wrap up a podcast stacy <laughs> i like that, I like that. I, you have to go anyway. on Fun. yeah for sure yeah go out with a splash yes so yes definitely so if you had to take today's conversation and you want to emphasize on a couple of important points before we go what would be some of the things you want the listeners to remember from our conversation yeah I, I, again i think you know if you if you have emotional mental health issues by all means get help and if they're severe 
I would certainly get medication. Don't, you know, the other thing, and this is a hard thing, is don't feel ashamed, especially if you're a man, you know, yeah. I think, and don't hold it in. Be willing to share and talk about it. You will right. be surprised. You will be surprised how empathetic people will be to your issue because yeah. everybody, I'll tell you, as the more I meet people, everybody is effed up. And, yeah. you know, my, my, I, I think I shared with the, you with this in the last, uh, my psychiatrist actually, while I worked at Nike, he actually saw some VPs at Nike and he didn't give me any names, but he goes, believe me, Mark, you, you're no more messed up than those guys are. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes you need, just need to hear that, Stacy. you know, it's like, I'm not, you know, yeah, you got a problem, but it's solvable and you're not that messed up. Right. And then, and, and then ultimately, and I'm a big responsibility accountability person is, you know, if you've got an issue, you've got to take responsibility. Nobody, as, as you and I have agreed, nobody's going to come knocking on your door and telling you they're going to fix you. And right. if you don't find, if you don't find the right psychiatrist or doctor or whoever, find somebody else. There's a million, there's a million people out there. And, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it's, it's like dating. You meet a million girls, but you only, you only marry one. Right. Or, t or two, or two, if you get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> There's that Irish wit again. <laughs> there you go. There how's, you that, go. how's that for a wrap up? <laughs> that is super wrap up. I love it. I love it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's an amazing conversation. I, you know, these, this is things that people need to listen to and really hear and understand because, you know, so many people think they're the only ones and so many people have, you know, gone through what you've gone. Well, not everything, but you know, they gone through different things, but had the, the, the same type of emotions and they just feel so alone and, and they just don't know what, where to turn. And I think, you know, by listening to everything that you've gone through in life and how you overcame it, it, it gives people hope, it gives people, you know, that, Hey, you know, if, if Mark could do it, so can I, you know, and, and, and it, you know, that's what people need to hear is that, you know, there's all, where there's a will, there is a way, you know, you just have to believe in yourself and you have to just, you know, you have to just listen to that inner voice in you and, and, and just follow your heart. And, you know, uh, I really commend you. And, and, and I do want to say, and you kind of alluded to it there, um, you know, I'm, I'm nobody special. I don't have any great gifts. You know, I, you know, I, my IQ is probably less than a hundred. Uh, you know, I just, I just pounded through it. You know, I just like, didn't want to give up. And, and so I guess what I'm saying is anybody can do it and it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy at all, but it can right. be done. It can, and it's, and it's worth it. I got yeah. my life back. I got my life back at, at 60. Now, you know, a little bit about me. I have, I have a home in Mexico and this home here in Oregon. I got no debt. I'm not rich, but I got no debt. I got a good life. I got a healthy family. I'm really the luckiest guy in the world. I love it. This has been amazing, Mark. You know, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And, and thank you for sharing your story. You know, it's 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 your story, especially because there's so many emotions and so many, so many obstacles you had to overcome. It's not easy for people to share their story. So I commend you. You know, it's very hard for people to talk about the issues that they go through in their own lives. But by listening to your story, I think it's an encouragement to others to open up and to get help that they need. So thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about these issues today. Thank you. My pleasure, Stacey. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.